it's time for us to dive right into the conversation. I mean, when we say the start of a new era of innovation, I guess due to the whole circumstances we see in 2020, um, you know, a lot of industries have been impacted and a lot of them are innovating or rechanging their business model, you know, just to be able to survive. And most of them are making those changes, not just to survive, but also permanently. And we've seen a lot of, you know, even the digital companies, uh, taking Apple as an example, who were saying, we're not going to go back to normal in the sense that, you know, 100% capacity people on site, you know, people are going to work differently from remotely. And we see a lot of other companies are doing the same thing. We see people thinking about, you know, restaurant differently, people thinking about, you know, the way banking is being done differently. And I guess those innovations will keep, you know, driving, you know, the conversation in different uh, sectors. Um, that said, um, I guess uh, just so everyone who is watching this, my name is Daniel Solomon and I'm the CEO of Euro Consulting. Euro Consulting is a business transformation agency here in Dubai. And we've been focusing on this particular webinar episode over the past couple of months on business transformation explain where we've deciphered multiple topics from fintech, healthcare, you know, food tech, you know, um, ad tech in different particular verticals. And I've had the privilege to be joined by brilliant minds such as Mustafa and Bill uh, over the past couple of months. And I'm pleased again to have this gentleman join on me today just to, you know, talk about what are the, you know, innovations that we see when we talk about the start of a new era we're talking about business models we're talking about you know the way even offline businesses are being run i'm, I'm seeing companies online who are changing the way people are you know doing a drive through to pick up their coffee you know just because of the pandemic um so gentlemen before i you know keep you know just talking um on this recorded session it'll be good for you guys to introduce yourself and we just dive into our, you know, short uh, conversation today. Sure. I, I'll do my uh, one, my one minute intro. So so my name is Mustafa Koita. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Koita Foods. We're a homegrown brand that started here in Dubai about seven years ago. Uh, I founded the company and, um, and at the time just had one employee and two products. Um, and we've since grown uh, quite rapidly. We, we're now in 11 countries. Uh, we're, all, we're all over the GCC. We're in Asia and um, uh, the Philippines, Singapore, um, and Vietnam. And we just launched in the United States. And the, and the products that we primarily um, sell are uh, milks, all shelf stable and aseptic packaging milks, uh, which are organic dairy. Uh, lactose free dairy and then we got into the plant-based space uh, about two years ago which has been a very high growth category uh, for us um, and we we operate um, you know through distri distributors in most of these countries but we do our own distribution in the U.S. Uh, and here. Well congrats on your launch Mustafa in the U.S. and I believe more countries will follow shortly. Thanks. Yeah, my name's uh, Bill Ashlock. Um, I'm also based in Dubai. I'm actually the founder of a new fintech proposition that really is geared around impact banking and redefining the way banking technology is delivered to banks and people that want to be in the banking space so that they can actually deliver and make an impact on their communities. So we're in the um, early stage launch. We've got about uh, 12 months of, of deep research as well as construction and planning going into our platform. And we hope to be operational towards the end of the first quarter of 2021. So. Um, well, Bill, I know you personally and uh, I know the hard work that you put into this particular project. So I'm excited for it to be launched. So it's great yeah. to have you gentlemen again today i guess you know for us to dive straight into the conversation i'm just going to start by saying what do you think guys is the new normal or would they be a new normal uh from your perspective i mean just looking at different industries um and based on what you've seen 
and then we could dive into the highlights you know in multiple industry that you've seen in 2020 i mean i can i can talk about it in terms of how it's impacted our business um look there are a couple areas that stand out um, when i look internal and external internal in the terms of how i run my company you know, we have about 30 employees right now. Uh, we have salespeople in some of these countries. And last year or the year before, we had budgeted a lot for travel. <laughs> you know, and, and I was on a plane. I was going to trade shows, whether it was Seal in Paris or Anuga or shows in Singapore. Um, and frankly, all my travel has been cut and my, my salespeople's travel has been cut down to zero. So, I, and frankly, I've started to enjoy, you know, more time at home, hanging out with the kids and whatnot. And, and I found and been very appreciative that now Zoom, you know, and Google Meets are available to us here, you know, in Dubai. And, and that, so that's one, one impact of the new normal is it's affected our T&E in, in a big way, but it's had a, had a positive impact on our, on our bottom line. The second thing is more forward facing. Um, I'm sorry, the one other thing internal is working from home, you know, so now you know, we used to have like random work from home days. Now we're only in the office two days out of the five days a week. And we thought we'd scale back up to, you know, five days a week in the office. And we've kept it because it just seems to work. Uh, and it's actually, in fact, I feel made things a little more efficient uh, for the for the folks. On the forward looking side, consumer behavior, I think the new normal has shown us that um, online purchases, uh, you know, Bosch e-commerce has really taken a huge growth uh, surge. Our, our online sales have grown around 370% if you average all the countries that we're in, uh, both Asia, uh, GCC, and even in the U.S. And that's pretty symmetrical across the world. It's not just like GCC or this or that. Um, and I think that consumers are also shifting in the sense that they've moved away from um, they've moved towards things that they can stock in their pantry, right? There's a lot, and, and, and where fresh was a really big, um, you know, uh, requirement, they've had to, in a sense, open their eyes and the, and the companies like mine have had to educate the consumers on, you know, the processes like UHT milk, shelf stable products, and the industry has also been forced to make their shelf stable products higher quality and and more tasty so i think those are the those are the those are the consumer side you know new normal changes that i've seen yeah well, I, I, I guess yeah please go ahead bill no uh, i'm just going to build on it i think one of the most radical shifts for anyone that's been involved in growing a business or working um across countries has been the change in travel um and i think that has forced us to rediscover new ways of building relationships with people virtually. And I don't know that we fully understand it. I find myself as a more tired virtually having conferences than I ever did traveling. Um, I could at least sleep on a plane and recover. Um, but, but virtually you tend to, to have much longer days than going out. I do also see tremendous changes in the banking and financial services space, very similar to food, and it all centers around touch points between the customer, the client, and the service provider. And historically, I think people accepted the role that banks needed to exist. I don't think we're near as hung up on whether a bank is truly a bank or a FinTech is a quasi-bank I don't look at Revolut and say, well, they're not really a bank. I don't look at TransferWise, I need you to a foreign exchange and say, well, they're not a bank. We actually just want solutions that work without the physical need to interact. And I think in general, that's redefining financial services in a very different way. Looking forward, the big thing, which I, I think is the consumer is expecting something that the industry isn't providing today. They're looking for, they're exploring, trying to find something that actually makes their life better, easier. And most banks are not plugged into that. So I think there's gonna be a lot of ongoing transformation in that space in 2021 and even beyond. Well, I'm sorry. I, just wanted, I just wanted a second one thing that Bill said, um, 
and I'm excited about the space he's in, is that, you know, we never really visited our bank, you know, even here after yeah. seven years of transact. We have a lot of letters of credit that we're discounting. However, there was a lot of paperwork. There's a lot, especially in this region, this is like, you know, the stamp loving region of the world. They love their stamps and signatures and all yeah, this stuff. Yeah. I do feel like COVID has put pressure on the banks to go a little bit more paperless. I'm praying that folks like Bill can help continue that push. Uh, but I certainly would, would love as a business owner to see the banks, you know, and I'm starting to get a lot more comfortable with them being virtual. They are all over the West virtual yeah. banks services you know and i think yeah. i hope i hope bill you bring it here faster i'm trying <laughs> you know that's the goal yeah the the last thing i was going to suggest is that i've also had zoom fatigue like i'm you know i love these zooms especially with you daniel and bill i'm going to make an exception but you need to put 15 minutes in between the zooms or you're going to get burned out and i found on the relationship wise to what bill said is that you can create virtual relationships. Like with our distributors around the world, we've switched to monthly Zooms and we over communicate now. But I've kind of found that there's a hybrid, right? If you can have one in-person meeting with them in the beginning yeah. and then the rest are Zooms, it's great. If you start purely on Zoom, you know, you need to, you need to have one date physically, you know, before you can go straight to the cyber thing. Um, and, the, and the last shift that I've seen is, I don't buy any more suits or like right now, this is like the most dressed up I've ever been, you know, in the last couple months. I just, I just wore this free, I'm wearing sweatpants underneath, you know I mean? Like my wardrobe, my suit, my suit guy, like gets no more business from me, man, because I'm like all blue lemon and sweatpants and yeah. stuff. So that, yeah. that's the last new normal I wanted to highlight to you. Yeah, no, I, well, I agree with you. I think suits are, are going to be a lot smaller. And at some point I need to weed out the closet because they're, they're not being worn. They're well, Bill, Bill, my suits can't get smaller because I'm putting on so much weight right now. You know, <laughs> I got, I got, I, we need elastic suits is what we need in terms of, that's the next company I'd like you to start is elastic suits. Well, you guys are cracking me up because, I, you know, and I picked three themes from what Mustafa, what you said and Bill, uh, starting from, you know, the consumer, then you, talked about, you know, the flexibility that you had, Mustafa, being able to work from home with your team and you had time to be able to connect with your family and which is great. And it's very fascinating to me because your business is very, you know, logistic heavy when it comes to distributing the products. Um, you know, a lot of people probably are still struggling to see how are they able to run a business such as yours that has a lot of operation, because even you, you have to deal with the imports of the goods coming in, and then you have to ensure that even though the consumers demand new products online, they've been delivered to the people. So yeah. working from home, how has that communication been possible? I, I think there must have been a little change in your overall operation to make that a success? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, you know, a ma the majority of our business is demand planning and forecasting and supply chain management, you know, especially when you're, you know, pro we produce a lot of our milks in Italy and then we ship them to 11 countries around the world. Uh, you have to demand plan at least 90 to 120 days in advance when you're working with the farmers and freight time. So let me just say, Listen, when COVID hit, it was tough. <laughs> you know, it was really tough on our supply chain. I mean, and I'll tell you some of the lessons learned, but you know, for a while, all the containers got stuck in China. You know, that impacted logistics, you know, for everyone in the GCC, surcharges started coming in. Um, and, you know, and then we had to demand plan during crisis, right? And so what we learned is a couple things is that one, demand planning is even more important, right? And when we would do the demand plan every month, we changed it to every two weeks because we needed to really track our data and be a little bit more sensitive to ups and downs, whether it was in the UAE or Philippines or Vietnam or the US. Number two is we increased our buffers, you know, so with the volatility of shipping, luckily, because we have shelf stable milk and some of the milks have six month shelf life, some of them have a year, our buffers, you know, we were trying to decrease um, you know, and limit our cash, right? We, we manage with our limited cash and not tie all the cash up in stock. We've realized that we're going to stock out if we don't put some cash here. So we've increased our buffers from, say, a month to more than a month, you know, now. 
Um, another thing is that we've also, and I think the logistics industry, especially when I talk about sea freight and air freight, we they have changed. You know, they're working on um, more adaptable, uh, quick to turn sort of solutions when crisis happens. So, you know, not able, not being able to book reefer equipment, not being able for you know shipping lines change more rapidly now. So we've built up just quicker communication systems to check in with them more frequently. So to answer your question, that's how it's affected us. You know, from for us working from home, we can communicate with our logistics providers. You know, they're they've also upped their game because they're a lot more aseptic in the way that they manage products. You know, they have a lot more stringent guidelines on how they package our stuff, how they move it, how they palletize it, how they break it down. So that's also happened. But you know, us interacting with them hasn't really affected, but the way and our style and our methodologies have been um, changed. Yeah, and I think for financial services, it's it's almost the inverse of that problem where um, the banks are trying to survive, and and within that, they're looking to tech and operations to solve what fundamentally is a revenue problem, and this is an industry that's been under pressure for the last five years, eight years, at least. One could argue ten. Um, I'm not at the moment very bullish on the banks readily being able to change very fast. Um, they don't have the right people. More importantly, they're not, uh, the mindset is caught between how do I appease my regulator? How do I do the old school stuff I did yesterday? And then how do I meet this changing, changing demand? Now, for me personally, it gives me a great business opportunity that I'm trying to fill. Um, but in the industry as a whole, I think competitors and the new upstarts are going to have lots of runway to be very successful for an extended period of time, just because the banks can't change uh, internally as much as anything else. Well, uh, one person once said that if you look at in each industry, that we see, you know, uh, automobile, the people who actually change the industry are not the people who were in the industry. Uh, yeah. Using the case of like uh, Tesla fixing, you know, sustainability in cars. And then you look at the guys who are doing, you know, the Beyond Meat, you know, where they meet guys or, you know, uh, before. Um, so yeah. I guess, you know, in the, every industry, thinking out of the boss always comes to fix the the kind of problems that you guys just highlighted with logistics, supply chain, and obviously the actual uh, ecosystem of, of a bank from a financial system. And yeah, I, think I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to highlight Bill's point is, as someone who's dealt with the banks from when we were at year one and year two, and now we're at year seven, it's been tough, you know, and I think that yeah. people like, we need more people like Bill, you know, in this industry, I think there's a huge opportunity. And he's right there. The banking industry is extremely has huge, you know, leaps and bounds of opportunity ahead of them if they can move fast. And, and you know, I mean, I tried to say that the right way, Bill. Yeah, you uh, did. That was thumbs so, up. I was the most so, creative, politically so, correct. Yeah, so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. We work with a fintech, another fintech company called Beehive in the beginning. They were like, yeah. you know, they would yeah. give us small loans and stuff, their credit. And where where, where the where it really hit the fan is, is that credit compliance, you know? And like, I remember we were dealing with a big bank who wanted our business and they're like, yeah, we'll lend you money. But the problem is, is like, do you own a warehouse? And I'm like, well, why would I own a warehouse? Cause you know, we're a new, a new age company that's all OPEX and less CAPEX, right? I'd rather, yeah. I'd rather put my CAPEX in more important things than a, than yeah. a commodity warehouse that some other logistics guy can own. But they wanted to securitize the loan, you know. So they didn't see that as a plus. They saw you not owning a warehouse as a negative. And I thought that compliance policy was counterintuitive to where, you know, modern businesses were moving, you know. And we went to a fintech company at the time, and they kind of they got it, you know. They figured out a way to securitize against something else, and you know, and they, and we grew, you know, at a, and, and I think we're one of the fastest growing healthy food FMCG companies in the region. And that bank missed that opportunity you know what i mean at the beginning yeah. so i think yeah. i think we need more bill we need you man we need more of you because uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the banking the banking part and the financing part 
for SMEs, when you when we were in SMEs, is, is, is really important. It's, it's, well, let's do the plug then. SMEs are the engine that makes every economy work. And, and you can do the stats. I think the least impact is something like 55, 60% of the employee base of a country is in SMEs. And uniformly, especially SMEs headed by women, do not have access to affordable financing. And, and two problems, frequently they don't get access at all. Second, if they did, the price they pay for that financing is just ridiculous and it destroys their margins. So yeah. something's gotta change. Um, you know, the, the first loan, the first loan that we got in year one, the interest rate was so high that it was higher than a loan shark in New York City. You know, yeah, and here, yeah. and, and here I am selling milk. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, now things luckily have changed. I think the good news is the government here has put a lot of pressure on the banks to support SMEs. But you know, it's it's tough for even the government to push them to have it all right. trickle down. You know, they're right. they're trying, but you know, there's still lots of opportunity. Yeah, it, it's for interesting sure. that you you talked about those opportunities, and uh, I love the way Bill, the way you ended it, and you talked about how SMEs are the building block or the foundation of every economy. And the challenge is still there with the bank. Um, and we, we see that today, that banks would only give you a loan if, you, you know, if you're a successful company. And then, you know, I'm sure like Mustafa, in your case, some banks are probably chasing you guys after seven years because you, you have, you know, a different, you know, uh, you, you know you, you, your books are different, right? Um, but how do we ensure that banks really understand, you know, that the ecosystem is not just a successful company that has assets? Because there are a lot of companies today with like SaaS applications who are not asset based. How do you ensure that, you know, we educate those banks, especially, my, you know, yeah. My personal opinion is the best way to get the banks to change is to have fintech startups succeed, get good publicity, and the CEOs and chairmen and boards of those banks see those articles and they see those companies that those missed opportunities and that will make them move. Competition will, will make them move or they'll acquire those companies, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and adopt them. I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't, I think that's a very, from when I look at the world and how things have changed, that's usually the most rapid way of getting large institutional companies to change is, is, is smaller, more nimble companies to come in and eat that pie and kind of show it to them. And, and right. I think, I think yeah. that, that will help. Right. And, and you've actually, Mustafa, touched on a really critical point is the big players see too much risk in endangering the mothership with a newfangled idea. So someone has to demonstrate that it works. Someone has to show that it's viable and it makes sense. Our go-to-market strategy is really premised around co-investing in three banks to show how it can and should be done. Just to that point, because there's not enough working examples of how banks can participate in a circular economy. And the, the challenge right now is life's gotten so chaotic and so complex, we will talk about sustainable development goals and we'll rah, 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 this is great, but we're actually not going to put our infrastructure into that because, well, I'm just a bank, I need to make money. And so we divorce from the community that we're a part of. And I just think we need to bring back that community, even if it's virtual, even if it's very different than it was a year ago or two years ago. At the policy level, we see how both of you guys, you're from two different industries where you guys connect. And this is very interesting. And uh, it's great to hear your perspective, you know, how these multiple industries interconnect and help each other to ensure that the overall business is a success. I mean, let's not just stop at the banks, but also bring in healthcare and other industries that you've seen uh, particularly during this pand pandemic, you know, how they interconnect to help each other. Look, I mean, I think we can all, we can all push the governments um, to support some of these new age policies, but 
I found in my experience, you know, we're part of a food and beverages association here in, in the UAE, and they have a direct line with, uh, you know, Dubai Municipality Food Control and ESMA and some of the departments that have hand in hand, you know, a vested interest in our industry, right? And I think Jill, I would assume is, you know, there are probably finance or organizations. I don't think we can come together and sign the same petition per se, but, but you know, they're, you know, like any government, you know, they have their ministries and whatnot. And, and I found the governments here have actually been pretty entrepreneurial themselves. I mean, the Dubai municipality, uh, as I mentioned in an earlier web webinar, we had a challenge with them once. And I literally, someone suggested, one of my local friends said, why don't you just walk into Dubai municipality and talk to them. And I was thinking to myself, I could never do that in the USA and walk into the FDA's office. They kick me out, you know? And I literally walked in the office, the head of food control, there was a lady there running it. And she had an open door policy on Tuesdays. And this is the top person that's right under the minister, listen to my problem and help me solve it. And she was very um, helpful, you know? So I thought that, you know, I think the government here you know, there it's, you know, there's a management team, it's a business, you know, they're trying to make a better lifestyle for themselves and everyone else. So if you if you approach them and help them understand a win win, the government's pretty, I found has had has been pretty uh, helpful and consumer friendly. Yeah, and I, I think you've touched on a really, really critical point, which is, first of all, we need to be vulnerable. Second of all, that we actually need to reach across the aisle to people in other parts of a business that we're dependent on and potentially can help and, and just be candid. I've got a problem. I find it horrendous that banking hasn't integrated with the Dubai ports for a seamless way of financing imports and exports out of the Emirates. Now, I've, I've heard rhetoric at one bank I used to be a part of, and we were a digital bank. I did the first digital bank in the Emirates and it was great that we started to have those conversations, but we never took them to its fruition. And someone is going to have to do that. And I think it's gonna be those bold conversations, as you say, of walking in on the right Tuesday and starting it and giving it a shot. We need yeah. more of it. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people, a lot of people just, don't think it's possible to walk into a government department and they'll be, I mean, look, with COVID and stuff, it was a little bit harder getting some of those meetings, but if you can yeah. get the right email address and you, you know, present your problem, you know, logically and show the benefits to both sides, you know, you have to do a little homework yourself too. Um, you know, there, you, like I said, you'll be surprised, you know, at how, at how entrepreneurial yeah. the is here. Yeah. Let, let, let's take a stop for a minute. 2020 was very challenging. We almost there. We have a few more days to go. Uh, and, you know, we just want to wish that the year after this would be a lot better. And we don't want to make all of those promises or get excited like we did for 2020. But I'm sure there's a lot of things that stand out out of 2020. Some are positive, some were challenging. What has stand out the most for you as the most innovative thing that is being done in different industry and it's been rapidly adopted? Um, maybe you want to go and just address this. Yeah, I would say that um, the big takeaway I get from 2020 is that there isn't actually a specific thing. I can talk about this trend or that tool or this contact or what have you, but I think for me, the big takeaway is adaptability, right? Your organization has to be adaptable. And I think it's, you know, I think it's the most important thing to survive. You know, you gotta be able to um, assess the situation without emotion. You have to get the right stakeholders involved. You have to make a decision and make a calculated risk. And then you have to implement it whilst getting all of your stakeholders within your organization and out of your organization on board, right? And that whole process, you know, I may have missed a few parts here and there, to me is how well you can adapt. And, you know, you need good management at the top that's open-minded to saying, hey, you know, we've been doing this thing for four years. We got to flip it and white slate this thing and look at it totally differently. You know, and I think like our online strategy was something that we adapted. You know, we shifted funding, we shifted time, we shifted resources, um, you know, to, to, towards that, you know, 
quick trend that we saw growing. So to me, I would say, you know, if I were to make a bumper sticker, it would be adaptability 2021, you know, and I think that's, that's, been, that's been helpful to us at least. Yeah, I, I would echo it. When I look at, at 2020, I don't find any particular, especially in financial services, there's no breakthrough, wow, kind of true innovation. Now there's a lot of payment enhancements and incremental evolution that are quite revolutionary, but they're just from a, the fundamentals. And if you were a leading edge banker in 219, you saw it finally matured. I think the real question, and you touched on adaptability, is who is innovating? It's not the big guys. You know, it's the small agile firm. It's the firm that not only is open-minded, but will have a honest conversation about the facts. So let me give you a couple of stats in financial services. In 2019, approximately half a trillion dollars, $500 billion was spent on digital transformation in financial services. The wow. users of those say only 5% of those projects were successful. Wow. Only 5%. 70% they would absolutely agree were outright failures. And yet, when we look at 2020, most banks are still acquiring and trying to transform the same way they did in 2019. Now, there's there are exceptions. It's really interesting. There's a new digital bank coming up in Dubai. It's really fascinating. They've taken a different approach. There's other ones that are emerging, again, that are taking very different approaches. But the majority of money, to me, has been squandered. Now, the innovation, when I look next year, is going to be adaptable. The ability to look at reality with, with just brutal awareness, and then in an optimistic way, just like what you've done in the food industry, you've gotten a lot more limbo and how you're doing your supply and your forecasting, a lot more agile internally with tough conversations, and then just saying, what do we do? And, and there's a lot of great ideas that haven't been tried or haven't been experimented or haven't been evolved to the point of being useful. And I think the old days where the guy at the top was this oracle that knew all, or <laughs> it's gone. You know, we got to get creative. We got to work together and we got to be open minded towards the future. I, I just, I, I really just love what you said, uh, both of you and uh, Mustafa, you know, when you say adapti uh, adaptability was key. I, I think that's just really awesome because in multiple industries, we're talking about healthcare. Uh, in previous webinar episode that we had, we had some doctors who could not do a home visit or a telemedicine before the pandemic, but now it's been accelerated. You know, hospitals are able to do business differently. And you talked about your industry and and then, you know, even in the financial sector, there were a lot of things that you could not do, you know, with your bank, that you have to be on site and those have been changed. Uh, so adaptability probably would be the main catalyst going forward that, you know, most businesses have to change the way they do that they do business. Um, probably the challenge with what Bill said with the banks is they, they've not been able to be in a position where they adapt, you know, using, you know, <laughs> Mustafa's uh, words uh, by you know, rethinking and pivoting your businesses and the business model. Um, and you see that from business or digital transformational initiatives using the key stats that um, Bill mentioned. Most digital projects just fail. It's not just in the, uh, in the banking sector. Just because people keep doing the same thing over and over and they don't bring in that key element of being able to adapt and make that change, the resistance to change. So no, I, I think, guess, yeah. yeah. The one thing I would just highlight is that, you know, when we talk about the big guys, whether it's on the banking side or on the food side, I mean, their ability to adapt, sometimes they just can't, right? Even as my organization's gotten bigger, you know, when we were two employees to now, you know, 30 something employees, I'm also a little slower. I'm still extremely nimble relative to my you know, billion dollar competition yeah. Yeah. side. Yeah. But you know, sometimes they can and sometimes the culture, whether it's a, a, a geographic culture or the culture of the leadership, 
it's just not into as much change. You know, sometimes they get a little, you know, and attract, and it also then attracts people that aren't big into change. They're more harvesters than, you know, people who, you know, Bill and I probably are the folks that knock down the doors, you know, and, you know, try to, you know, break things, try and do things a little different. So I've also, I think the big organizations internally, they can't do those adapt adaptions, but they actually inside really want folks like us you know, like Bill and I to like innovate and do it probably a little bit better than they can themselves. Even if they threw a billion dollars at it, you know what I mean? All right. No, and, what about and we use the kiss. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh, no, no, I want to reemphasize that. You know, it's almost in fairness too. So big companies have some really interesting challenges. In banking, very few banks have technology individuals on staff with the skills of being cloud enabled digital first. They just don't have them. And yeah. even greater shortage, which is, which is worldwide, is people with banking experience that know how to think beyond yesterday's legacy. That is a shortfall that, that transcends growing markets, developed markets, any way you want to look. And so the challenge is, you have to have the small guys, innovative guys come and bring in those radical thoughts. And then even then it's a struggle to get the team across it, people to buy in, and it's a big shift. So it's gonna move slowly. And that's just reality. Yeah, um, yeah. I probably have a different perspective. I, and I understand uh, what you guys said, uh, you know, it gets complex as the company gets bigger, but we've seen businesses that think just differently uh, and taking the case of Microsoft, I guess. And if you compare Microsoft maybe with other companies, I think Microsoft is a company that, you know, they just, as they get bigger, they try to think, you know, as startups as much as possible. Um, and that has probably helped us to see the way they've been able to re reinvent themselves over the period. So it's probably related to what Bill said about the personnel, because it's not just about having the idea, it's having the you know top executive, the stakeholders to buy in and to, to be able to take that leap of faith that this would actually work, you, you, you know. Right, but, but don't lose Mustafa's point around culture. And, and Satya didn't change the Microsoft direction in a few months or a few days. It actually took several years. And he started with his core leadership team and had the space to not only be lucky on some of his decisions, especially the emphasis on the cloud, but, but also a management team that in the main bought into it. And I think that's quite unique among big companies. Um, and the level of which they're ingrained in the new philosophy is extraordinarily deep, which again, in my experience, is quite unusual. So they have the brutal reality and the tough conversations with this uh, almost idealistic vision of their role in society and being a member of society. So if I look at Microsoft comparing to some of the other big tech giants, they're not trying to be all things to all people in all ways. Uh, they're trying to be in a, almost a niche if a $20 trillion company can be in a niche, uh, <laughs> which I know is a little bit of an oxymoron. Uh, you know. Well, it's, I, 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 it's definitely very fascinating. I really think it, it all falls down to uh, you know, the culture, uh, going back to Mr. First Point connecting it with, you know, the management's buy-in and obviously the people. And on the people side of things, when we talk about, you know, the consumer data, what are the, some of the interesting cases of behavior that were unique to you in 2020? And those you think would stay and those you think would, you know, be dropped by the, those consumers? I guess uh, Bill and Mustafa, you have a different perspective given you have different industry that you cover. Look, I think that um, when we talk about people, I'll, I'll, again, I'll answer it from two perspectives. Um, on the consumer side, you know, people, uh, again, have shifted towards staying at home, uh, you know, instead of going to the restaurant or shopping at the grocery store, instead of, um, you know, uh, buying ready-made meals or starting to cook at home, 
Um, you know, they're getting into more family type events. You know, they're, they, they, they've changed. And I think e-commerce is the biggest sort of bullet point or, or data point that you can see that, that trends on that. And, and, and retail growth, you know, I think on the, I do want to highlight that the internal company uh, people stuff has also changed, you know, and I mean, we've talked about working from home and all that kind of stuff, but when you take your employee out of the office environment, you're not micromanaging them or you, or you have less visibility of what they're doing. And, you know, we don't micro, you're, the management styles also make a difference. So at Koita, We've always been about empowering the employee, right? I have a very, I would like to say, Western American style of business management. And I've seen how it defers to some of the Eastern style business management. You know, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they're different. So, so from my, as the founder of the company, my philosophy is that I work for my employees, right? And, and, if, and, I, and there's never a bad employee. If there's a bad employee, it's my fault. We either recruited the wrong person, we incentivized them the wrong way, or we're not giving them the right tools. So that's kind of our culture of how we look at employees. Because now that they're away three days a week, you cannot be around them. You gotta you gotta empower them, and they they have to have a fire under their ass to want to do what they want to do because they love what they do. They they can't be fear driven or work. You know what I'm saying? So. I think that's just an important point on people internal that you have to you have to look at. And I think again, the the startups, you know, whether it's Bill's company or mine, I will assume, are more act into that kind of culture than you know the larger organization. Yeah, Ben, I would add on that um, when the the young child pops in, I have a product development person I work with frequently. Her son is really vocal, and when he shows up. You know, it's just you might as well take it with a grain of salt and smile and and um, kind of go with the role. And I think a lot of this traditional hierarchy of manager, employee, boss, supervisor is it's become much more human now, even though we're more disconnected. And um, I almost think like when you talk about that first um, relationship, meeting them and almost the first date. I've even started now having my virtual first date where the only agenda is tell me your story. Um, and, and a genuine desire to know who they are as a person so that it allows us to interact virtually in a more effective way. And they have great stories that emerge. I mean, just some people, I just love their stories so much. I want to work with them, even though I don't know where it's going. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think, I think also, you know, just another experience is that we started empowering a lot more P&L ownership uh, to our employees where they, to even a certain degree, and we, we're trying to get there. I can't, you know, I'm at a certain level where I can't do it 100%, but we want to allow them to operate as entrepreneurs within an entrepreneurial environment. And that means, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's P&L ownership, right? If they, if they can own the dollars in their department, or people within their department can own the dollars. They love it. You know, they thrive. They 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 are better managers of that P and L than I am because they're just closer to the you know closer to the the, the, the details. Right? So, so you know, and I read a Harvard Business School case study about um, a tech gaming company that did a very similar thing where they set up little mini businesses where everyone was like competing against each other, and they just killed it. They ended up becoming a multi-billion-dollar company. But um, but you were try I'm trying to do more empl em employee empowerment, and again the philosophy is I work for my employees. You know, because because in this day and age, you know, fear driven employment management styles are just not going to attract the right talent or the right culture. We build people, not companies, because companies is just probably a structure. So I love the way you you kind of talked about it. I, I have these two questions, which are very, very direct for different, um, you know, verticals. So on the food security and logistics and the one on, you know, fintech. So the first one would be to build on the money movement side of things, you know, how money has been, you know, adapted when it comes to the money tech adaptation. Uh, looking back now, what do you see the positive and what could be done better? Um, I think there's a lot of teams that we've covered 
you know, at the start of the year where we talked about, you know, FinTech, what are the adaptations? So from then till now, what can be done better and what have you seen that being positive? Yeah, I think the, the big thing that you see the trends accelerating in 2019 and you've seen it mature this year is the origination of financial services and who gets that first touch. Where does a consumer go for foreign exchange? Where does the consumer go for a loan application? And more and more frequently, the US is heavily dominated by mortgage originations don't come directly to the bank where the client talks to the bank, they go through an intermediary. I think that's a real positive that consumers have more choices. The thing that frustrates me is a lot of new choices. And there was a high street bank this last week that announced a new SME FinTech partnership uh, to do invoice financing. And it was presented as this is going to be something really amazing for SMEs. If you looked underneath it, the interest rate, the best interest rate they would give is 12% annually. And I'm just looking at going like back to the point of loan shark rates. 1% a month is not affordable financing. And so what disappoints me is accessibility and affordability are missing elements frequently in the financial services being offered, especially to micro SMEs. They're just getting killed. Um, so I think that's something that has to change in the near future. I agree. Accessibility is definitely very, very key. And, you know, and I see connecting that with the SEC, you know, changing, you know, some of the regulation in the US about who can be, you know, an accredited investor that also helps to give, uh, you know, uh, that accessibility to a lot of people. So yeah. in the financial uh, sector as a whole, uh, I'm going to turn the, the cap to uh, Mustafa on the food and security and logistic. What did you learn from 2020? And what do you think that you will continue to do in 2021 and years to, to come? Um, look, I learned a lot <laughs> in 2020, um, and, and I've learned that I'll continuously be learning until the day I, you know, pass, you know, because so many things happen that I never thought would happen, right? And so um, I also learned that everyone's connected, um, uh, whether it's geographically or across industry or government departments, we're all, we, we need to be nice to everybody because it's someday, it's someday in some shape shape or form, you will, you will be, you know, affected by the doctor, you know, or the lawyer or the logistics guy in, in yeah. one way or another. And, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, at a tactical level, you know, we've learned about e-commerce, we've learned about keeping bigger buffers, we've, uh, we're more nimble on our demand planning, I think there's some tactical takeaways, but I'll come back to the theme um, that, you know, I was trying to promote is adaptability, you know, and, and it just can't be the CEO. I can't handle that on my own. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I, I already lost my hair after my second kid was born. You know, so, right, uh, right, right, and, right. And, and after my third one is born, my hair is gone permanently, you know, so, so, so I need my management. You have to teach adaptability to your management and you have to teach it to yeah. every single one of your employees. And so we've had meetings and in the meeting, we've we've highlighted, hey guys, adaptability is a real KPI. You know, show me examples of how you've adapted. And the only way you can really have adaptability work in your organization is if your employees feel empowered to make suggestions on current processes. You know, failure is accepted in the organization as a process and not a negative. You know, um, you know, all those things kind of are interrelated. So, so look, I've learned a lot. <laughs> You know, I, I think we all want, you know, a little bit more stable 2021, but, yeah. you know, we're ready. We're, we'll hope for the best and plan for the worst. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, well, this is one that I want to ask both of you guys, because what is the question that you not ask yourself that you think that we should have? We should have just looking into the year coming in, Looking at this year, 
looking at all what we've basically done, even from a health point of view, from a family point of view, just what should we have asked each other that we've not? Probably, I guess, I start with Bill. Um, just, yeah. yeah, no, I, um, I have a very strong view on this, and it was triggered by um, my wife, who's Singaporean, asking me a question about the U.S. Uh, behavior and politics and finances and everything else. And I said, you just have to understand we have a current regime, I'm not doing a plus minus about it, that is actually behaving just like every Singaporean does, just on an order of magnitude times 100. And her natural response as a Singaporean is, what's wrong with that? And I said, there's a simple answer. We are too big to not care about our neighbor. We are too big to not care about the people at risk, the companies at risk. And, and if there's one thing that I think we need to ask ourselves is, am I responsible? Am I accountable for making a difference in the people and the companies that I touch? And if you're gonna be a little isolated island, then the answer is no, but I believe that we're all interconnected. And back to your point, there's it's three degrees of separation. So Mustafa and I have a shared bond of Pune and Bombay, and who knew? <laughs> and, and we're looking at our faces, and I'm the one that should be from New Jersey, but I'm not <laughs> he's from New Jersey. And it's like the world's all mixed up. And and in a sense, we're kindred spirits that that the interconnectedness of the human family has been ignored for far too long. And I think 2021 is the year we start seeing a fundamental and I hope permanent change towards thinking about our fellow man and woman and giving them affordable, accessible, inclusive financing, but at the same part, working across the spectrum so that what can I do as a bank to help a food logistic company? How do we work together to make a difference in a country at risk? Um, and and there, in every country, in every community, there is one economic stat that should absolutely get you livid about not making a difference. And for me in one developing um, African economy, it was 47% youth unemployment man, do I want to make a difference in that country? It's not my home country, but 47% youth unemployment is unacceptable. There are problems here in the Emirates. Man, let's team up. Let's help the Emiratis solve those problems. You know, I just don't think we're isolated islands. I think we're all part of a big family and we need to wake up, smell the coffee and <laughs> deal with your brother and sister, wherever they are. Very That's inspiring, Bill. And now I wanna, I wanna hear Mustafa just, <laughs> you know, say from his perspective. Let inspire me, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no way. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, listen. First of all, Bill stole my thunder on that question, man. He just killed oh, it. Man. Everything I was gonna say, Bill, you just, you took it, man. You took it. I, I, I couldn't. Honestly, I don't have a lot much more to add. Um, but look, I, I mean, if I were to throw some takeaways or some inspiration, I think that 20, you know, I believe everything is how you look at it, right? Everything is about your, the, the goggles you're wearing. You can, you can be in the shittiest situation and you can see the positive on it and you can think positive and you can become positive and do positive things, or you could have a different set of glasses on it and just focus on the negative and you will by default focus down on that negative path i'm a big believer in and you know in looking at the glass half full and and to bill's point of view i think when we were stuck in lockdown and we couldn't leave our homes you know i wasn't traveling for, you know i was out, i was out of the country probably two weeks out of every month or one and a half weeks yeah. i didn't spend a lot of time with my kids i never thought i'd have to spend the whole day with my seven-year-old trying to walk her through online schooling, right? Which was, <laughs> which was a, both a love-hate relationship, but you know, it it brought me closer to my family and my values as a man 
uh, in the family and you know their mother and I both got closer to our kids and we saw things from a different perspective that only a shock to the entire world could have created and I'm, and I'm actually grateful um, for that situation because I, I see the positive you know in it. so so look I'm not trying to I can't say I have the answer for exactly what you're asking for but just continue to look at the positive because it's your only way if you want to move in that direction is to look at the positive you know and that and that two bills um, point it involves you know just being nice to everyone else you know you don't have to be a jerk to everyone give everyone the benefit of the doubt there's one quote that I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this sometimes you come across those people that are total jerks you know whether it's in business or maybe the banking sector or maybe you know <laughs> and anytime I meet a mean person there's a famous author who said something he said hurt people are hurt you know pe people who hurt are hurt basically and so it made me realize that even when the other guy or girl across the counter is like being mean to me there's a reason why they're that way they had a bad day too and it just made me a lot more forgiving you know and a lot more understanding so that when they rattle something off at me i just absorb it because i'll think the first thing that'll come to my mind if an employee is angry when they come to the office i'll say they probably had a bad day and i let it go you know so so i let my ego my ego i don't have an ego anymore there's no more ego. So, so those are, those are my, those are my, that's my ramble of inspiring words that, that you'll get. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever make me answer a question like that after Bill. I, I, he'll always have with this great, true. great president. I, I just butted in and jumped ahead, so. <laughs> you guys have been both very inspiring, and I also love the positive outlook that you guys had, um, you know, when we just had this chat. I think that this is what we need moving forward. We're not sure what's gonna come in 2021. But one thing that I think it should remain sure is having a positive outlook, being ready to adapt and make changes and obviously, you know, stay optimistic. And uh, like you said, connect with our family, connect with our own inner being. I think that's also very, very key. And of course, looking after our health, you know, um, those are really, really important. That said, I think my last question for you guys before we wrap up today is, is around healthcare. Would you guys take the vaccine and what would you say to the person who is not taking the vaccine? Oh man, that's a loaded question. That's a loaded question. That's a tough one. Look, you know, as a parent, you know, I got three kids and I, you know, I just feel like personally, I would have felt more comfortable if there was if the vaccine went through a bit more of a thorough process, a more timely, natural process, I think we all understand the urgency of, of bringing it, but I feel like we're in the beta stage still, you know? So I would have felt more comfortable, you know, if the vaccine had gone through a little bit more testing, but, you know, I'll just say I haven't done my, I'm not a doctor, you know, I have to rely on my friends and my doctor's friends and they're, they're you know, reading, but, you know, if it helps save the economy, <laughs> You know, uh, you know that that there's mixed feelings there on it. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say it's one way or another, but I just would have felt better if we had more more time on the vaccine. But I think we needed to we needed to bring it out as soon as possible. Right, and I would probably build on that a little bit. I think having a blanket an answer um, does two things. One is it simplifies a very complex question, and the people at risk and the reason they're at risk to different vaccines doesn't kind of come through in whatever simplistic answer you give. The second part is um, there are people with good scientific kind of research that have a concern about vaccines in general. And this one, again, I'd like to see a lot more peer review. I'd like to see a lot more open, open debate about the pros and cons and the risk. I think the bigger thing that I worry about when it comes to that is we're putting a vaccine out for something that we do not fully understand how we get it. Um, and until I better understand the, the whole process around becoming infected, um, and I look as a case in point, my uh, daughter was diagnosed just in the last two days with COVID. 
This is a neo ICU nurse that knows the protocols and is zealous about doing all the proper precautions, and yet she still has been impacted. So I think that the simplicity of the answer would be a little bit of a misnomer. And I just think we need a lot more conversation, a lot more transparency than we have today. Um, I totally respect you guys' comments on that. And I also am aligned with you guys. I think it's a complex matter. Uh, it's just at this particular point, we have family and friends who are writing us to ask us, should we take a vaccine or not? Uh, and we just have to be able to tell them, you know, this thing falls down to, you know, a personal uh, decision um, because people are at different comfortable comfortability level, especially when you have, you know, kids and elderly parents involved, people with allergies. So we have to basically watch closely, thank the medical um, emergency team who are basically helping us throughout the year. I think we have to give them a shout out and it's been really, really awesome. And we have to really stay optimistic, like we said, for 2021. You guys have been fabulous. And I'm going to ask you guys to give one, one word for what you're looking ahead for, um, for 2021. I'll say positive. Interesting. Um, I would use the one word, impact. Uh, wow. Esoteric answer, but how about you, Daniel? What's your word? Positive and stay committed. That's, wait, 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 that's three. Daniel, you got to pick <laughs> one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> no, no. We need one word, buddy. I was like commitment. Commitment in a sense that. You know, <laughs> No, no, I'm Okay, all right, let's do this. I know where it's going. As a moderator, I'm just oh, calling you out that it's not yeah. one word. You call them out, man. <laughs> you guys have been really, really awesome. And uh, I love, you know, just having a chat with you guys. And uh, I want to wish you guys Merry Christmas to those who are celebrating and Happy New Year in advance to everyone who is listening. And uh, I get to see you guys before the year ends. And if we don't, we're going to see each other the next year, 2021, hopefully COVID free. So That's have good. a blessed day, guys. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye.